D Rob's going to give us the insights on what he sees out of DJU. First of all, Dominic, nice to be talking to you in the new year. And uh, tell us a little bit about the project and, and maybe some of the preconceived notions you had about what DJU was. Man, this was really, really fun. Um, this was probably the most surprised or contrast um, that I've had in terms of my hypothesis going in and what I thought I was going to see and then kind of what I got got coming out. Um, but yeah, this was this was an exciting one. This is a fun one, obviously, for the first time. Um, you know, we're having to replace place Jordan and, um, you know, a guy who turned our program around, who really, um, you know, changed everything uh, for us and something, you know, that we owe. We, we can't we couldn't repay him you know, how much we owe him for for what he did for this program. So replacing him is obviously going to be a very tall order. And um, it's great to see that they went and got a guy with some great experience and, um, you know, and a guy with some uh, tremendous talent. And, you know, the, the stage will never be too big for him. So we won't give away all the secrets, but we've learned that your opinion changed a little bit or was refined on DJU. We're going to start in today's video with the Clemson part of DJU's journey. So this is going to be in stages. Today is going to be the breakdown on what DJU was at Clemson. So I'll pull up the film now. You'll see uh, familiar jerseys on the screen. This was a, a game that I know, Dominic, you attended a couple of years ago. Uh, in Death Valley, Florida State gave Clemson all they could handle, and they were a four-minute uh, execution away in the fourth quarter of winning that football game. Let's get to the clips. Is this the good section of what DJU brought to the table? Yeah, let's start this. Let's start this first clip, and um, you could you could tell me if this is good or not. Um, so again, this is a very good Florida State front. Um, Here's he's in an empty set. So that means there's obviously no one in the backfield. So he knows he's got a five man protection, um, but he knows he's only getting rushed by four. He's trying to read something here to the offense is right. He works middle. Right. Middle's not there. And he throws an absolute dot. And this is this is this it looks way easier than it actually is. This is a incredibly tough throw. Now he is on the near hash. So at the college level, that's that's a lot closer than it would be on at the at the pro level. But this is a heck of a throw after going through a full progression where he reads the right side of the field to the middle of the field to the outside. Now, this is something that they asked him to do at Clemson. This is not something that's a heavy feature in the Mike Norvell offense. But this is and this is not something that they asked him to do at Oregon State. So this is obviously earlier in his career. Um, and he's progressed a lot since then. And this is a, you know, that's a pro style, um, throw and read right there. He really has a strong arm and, um, and he, he can pinpoint some passes. He has some inconsistent inaccuracies, but he's a heck of thrower, of, uh, thrower of the football. That seems to fit more in the Mike Norvell. So you're talking about progressions. It's not really what Florida State does, at least at this point in Mike Norvell's tenure. But that looks like isolation, finding a matchup and making a throw. That seems very much what Mike Norvell is all about. That type of yeah, we, yeah, and we saw a lot of that this year. We, we did the JT breakdown. Um, we saw that that was kind of a progression that, that Mike Norvell went to was allowing – um, you know, the guys that we went and got, you know, the, the, the transfers to play some one-on-one -on -one ball because they just were better than, than their opponents. And that's an example right there. That's a, that's a one-on-one -on -one deal. Um, you know, when I say that they don't typically have full field progressions is what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. you know, in mm -hmm. terms of we don't do a lot of drop back passes because that wasn't necessarily Jordan Jordan's uh, strength. He was really good in the in the run fake, play action fake, RPO game, and um, you know, and, and obviously really good with quick game and, and things like that. So this was uh, you know, these these are two really good things to see in terms of, you know, uh, I think the knock on on um, on DJU would probably be his his inaccuracy. Um, it, you know, his, his passing percentage is lower than you probably would like it. I think he's somewhere around 57% this year, um, where, where Jordan was somewhere up above 60%. So, um, you know, that's something that's, that they're going to really want to work on, but it's definitely in there. All right. Now here's a throw 
um, that shows a lot of things, a lot of things that make you incredibly encouraged if you're an offensive uh, coach. The ball is on the far hash. He's throwing the ball from the 10-yard line. That ball's caught on the 30-yard line. It has a layer on it over the apex defender. That's, uh, I believe, 23 there or 25 there in the slot. He throws that ball over him and lands it perfectly in the boundary. Wide receiver doesn't have to slow down at all. Um, this is something that will – this will get you – this is where you get drafted. <laughs> You know, this is the throw that you hear everyone talking about, you know, the throw from the far hash, you know, they, they call it the far comeback. Um, you know, he's actually running it out here, but this throw um, and, and really one thing that I loved about it, and this is something that I was kind of hard on JT about during the season was there is no hesitation on this at all. He's taking three steps and that ball is out. And so the he when he throws and when he releases that ball, the wide receiver is not even looking. Yep. You see, the wide receiver's got his head turned, and the ball is on him by the time he gets his head around. Okay, that's a that's a big time throw. Um, and here's kind of that comeback. It's actually a back shoulder throw here. Mm. At, this is an absolute dart. He's on the far hash again. Wide receiver gets an outside release. Uh, again, it's twenty yards of of distance. And probably about 30, 32 yards of width. So you're talking about a 50-yard throw here that he makes look like it's just pitch and catch in the backyard. Um, there's nothing you can do from a coverage standpoint differently about this. You are in the perfect position, and you have to protect for the ball going deep and over your head. So if that quarterback can put that ball there with that sort of velocity, it's a wrap. You can, you can, just, you can absolutely win games with that. So good DJU for a defensive coordinator. You've got to be you got to at some point just say he's going to make three or four throws a game where I'm just going to have to say, well, that's good on you son because there's nothing I can do, right? Absolutely. Yeah. This is I mean, this is thrown with velocity. It's spun well. It's on time. Um there, there's nothing you can do. There's no coverage. Um man, you could drop 11 and that ball's going to be completed. Okay, one of the consistent things that I also saw um, watching both Oregon State film and the Clemson film was the idea or ability of DJ to just take care of the ball. He's just a tremendous caretaker. He's not going to put the ball in harm's way. Here's a, a, a concept that you will probably see, um, you know, hit with the Seminoles. They're running fake QB counter. So QB counter out of empty. I'm sure, you know, throughout that week, Coach told them, you know, and they were planning on this being a big shot. Now, usually when you tell a player that, they're willing to risk it because they're they're you're practicing this all week and you're getting this shot. And so you can see they thought they were going to get a shot. It gets covered well. You know, the secondary stays back. They don't come down to take the counter. And he realizes he's got pressure. Instead of escaping and trying to do something wild and crazy and, and getting a fumble here or throwing this ball and putting it in harm's way, he just chucks it, you know, chucks it to the sideline, um, you know, to, to our equipment guys over there and uh, lives to fight another day. And that's, you know, you can't talk about how important that is too much because you don't put the defense at, in, in uh, positions where, you know, when you have a good defense like, like we have now at Florida State, you don't want to give them short fields to, to work with. If teams got to drive the whole way down the field, it's going to be really hard to beat you. So he's very steady hand in terms of taking care of the ball instead of this feast or famine. It's either the big splash play or it's an interception or a fumble. Um, you know, DJ's incredible caretaker of the ball. So those are the good characteristics from DJU. You see the processing power. You see him going through progressions, big time throws, big time cannon of an arm and then caretaking of the football. But obviously he left Clemson for a reason. Might not have been all on DJU, but it didn't work out there, and he wanted to go play on the West Coast at Oregon State. So, Dominic, what are some of the negative things you've seen or things that he needed work on once his time with Clemson was up? Uh, one of the consistent things that I saw were um, abilities for the wide receivers to get yards after catch. And um, the placement of the ball, restricting them from doing that or just missing 
um, an open receiver in a yak opportunity uh, altogether. So the next two clips are really kind of the same route, same concept and opportunities where they could have gotten, you know, some, some bigger gains and, um, and just, you know, lack of ball placement here. So, you know, this is uh, probably at the time their best player, um, the, the Shipley kid, you know, at running back, they get exactly what they want here. It's one-on-one -on -one with your sixth or seventh best coverage defender, maybe at best. And if he can place that ball on him, like throw it at that ref, essentially, maybe a little to the left of that ref, um, that's going to be a catch and run opportunity big time. Uh, not only does it not happen, you know, in terms of, you know, a catch and run, but you don't even get a completion there. Um, you know, the, that's, that's something that you're going to see, um, you know, that, that I saw that that could be a little bit better. Here's the, the tight angle. You can see it a little bit better. You can see there's great move. There's plenty of space, maybe a little bit of pressure there, but he could probably just slide up in the pocket, which, you know, he tends to do a really good job of maneuvering the pocket here. He just steps up and puts that on him. You know, that's going to be a big gain. He's going to make somebody miss and, and run after the catch. This next play, um, again, kind of same same concept. This is first down also. That, that last play was first down. Here's another first down opportunity. They run that same sort of angle or short post route here with, uh, I guess this would be a Y, uh, tight end, tight end type body. He gets exactly what he wants. Now you get a catch, you get a first down, but if, imagine if he catches that ball, if it's just put on his body, there's nobody within 15 yards of him. And uh, you would imagine this has got to be a touchdown or at least getting the ball down inside the 10. There's a lot of space. <laughs> yeah. 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 And these are, these are ones that you, you're just screaming up in the box right now. You're going, we got to tell ourselves a touchdown and then, you know, you got to kind of regroup your, your mentals because it ends up just being a first down and which is still a good play. You don't want it to feel like it's a bad play. Um, but man, you had a chance. You don't get a lot of opportunities like that at this level of football. Well, and if you're operating and, and, you know, Florida State's replacing a lot this year, uh, Dominic, you know, they could replenish and, and just roll right on. But if the margin is slimmer in some of these games and it comes down to one possession late, you're thinking about this. If it happens in the second quarter, you're thinking, oh, my God, if he just laid it on him, you know, it's it could be the difference. Absolutely. The Absolutely. And I'll tell you, I believe that Coach Norvell and his offensive system, from what I've seen, they really do depend on that. You know, Florida State averaged, um, you know, this past season, they averaged 7.8 yards after catch. So, you know, they're they're essentially getting eight yards after catch, you know, um, pretty consistently. Um, both DJ's teams at both Clemson and Oregon State averaged 5.2 yards after catch. Mm. Now, again, there's a difference in talent level, probably. Um, but I do think that that tells a story in terms of the quarterback's ability. It's not just on the wideouts and it's not just on the defenses to tackle those guys. A lot of times it's the ball, the placement of the ball. And um, so I thought that that was one of the things that um, that's going to be a huge point of emphasis uh, in terms of getting out of DJ what you got out of out of JT, because, you know, to average eight yards after catch, I think that's something that you're depending on. And that three yard margin is huge. You're talking about the difference between being in third and three and third and four or being in, uh, or being fourth down, you know, if you could just, you know, catch and run after. So, so yeah, that's, that's going to be one thing that we're going to have to really keep our eye on and probably something that will, you know, if we're sitting here, you know, you know, wishing that we were better on offense, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's one of the things that we, we pinpoint is that the guys aren't being able to catch and run as much as they were uh, the last two seasons. We've seen the good, we've seen the bad, and that's with his arm. But what about DJU imposing his will? He's a humongous body, D-Rob, but then also he can run a little bit. What are some things you saw from the dual threat nature of what DJU brings to the table from Clemson? So you're right. He's a great body and he's a great athlete. I, the, my um, concern or challenge for us Noel fans is he's not the athlete that JT was. And... Um, you know, that, that may frustrate us in some, some instances, 
but I do think that he is definitely above average, you know, ball carrier. And, and we saw it both this year and, and two years ago, uh, this year at Oregon state. And then two years ago at Clemson, you know, at Clemson, he had 540 yards rushing, uh, you know, so this year that we're looking at, um, they didn't use his legs nearly as much, um, this year at Oregon state, but he definitely has that ability to do that. So here is a, a, a good look at a common uh, concept that, that, um, that Seminole and Mike Norvell run. They run counter with the guard and the Y. So it's counter G Y with the quarterback. So really good play. Again, I think it's important to know the down and distance here is third and two. You know, this is the third. You got to have it here. You're backed up a little bit. It's third and two. You got to have it. They put the ball in his hands. And, um, you know, with his body, his frame, and his athleticism, you know, this is a good, good play call at a good time. And they're, they're able to get it. He's able to pick up about three and a half, four yards. Um, that's, a, that's a good play for him. Now, here's a little bit uh, different situation. Now they're in the, the, the high red zone. Um, they're more in an open set. And they just run, they're just running here, uh, you know, a, a read. They're running zone read. Or really, this is probably zone lead. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so he's he's not reading that. That's that he that's a design for him to pull that. And uh, you know, because you could see you know, Shipley's going to block right away. And uh, you know, they'll they'll try to put the ball in his hands. And and again, he's not the explosive, you know, mover that 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 Jordan is. Um, but he's definitely a, an efficient runner uh, with obviously great power as long as you can keep him healthy. I believe in this game he actually had a knee issue. Um, it may not have come up yet, but it's 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 uh, at some point in this game I remembered that he did have uh, something happened with his knee. Here's the last run play. Um, again, a more open set. This is more of a, you know, probably closer to Norvell. He didn't do a lot of this, you know, and um, this is just quarterback draw here. Um, you know, they, they essentially they line up. They see that the box is open, meaning they've really got a five-man box here. And so now we've got five to block five, plus we get the running back. So it's really becomes, you know, it's a six-on-five opportunity. We should be able to get some good amount of yards here, especially on first down. Oh, no, it's actually second and second and long here. So they're trying to get back to a third and manageable. And, um, you know, Florida State actually does a really good job here, you know, because they're they're outmanned at the point of attack and they they they're able to uh, you see number zero. They're pushing, pushing the pocket and, you know, putting putting the ball carrier in a bad, bad position. But, you know, that's that's a little bit of a video of him running the ball. And I uh, think he could definitely do it, but it's going to be, you know, short, short yardage it will be a, a great opportunity to use him as a weapon. It seemed like too, just in, in watching him from his days at Clemson, he has pretty good vision if he can get out to the open field. Like Dominic, it seems not every quarterback has an idea about, you know, they're just good athletes. Sometimes they're just good athletes. And so uh, it's it's not about like uh, the skills that you would have as a tailback or a halfback. But it seems mm -hmm. like he does have a good sense of allowing for blocks to develop and then also open field moves. There's some uh, clips that we'll have later where he's scrambling. And his ability to decipher scramble to run versus scramble to pass is very high level. He's not just going to put his head down and go um, and predetermine that he's scrambling. And also when he is scrambling, if you do come open, he will put it on you. He will make guys miss. It's not like he's he's not some big, you know, Byron Leftwich or, right. or Ben Roethlisberger. You know, he, he's a good, good athlete. He can make guys miss. Um, and, and he will do that. And I've got a couple clips that I could show, uh, that we'll show for the, from the Oregon state game. You know, we're looking at clips specifically from the Florida state game, but I mean, you've seen a lot of the numbers you, uh, deep dive in multiple games. What do you think about DJ use time at Clemson? Why did he leave? What, what went into it? You know, I think the biggest storyteller in terms of his time there at Clemson, is the fact that he came in with the expectation of the number one player of the country and he was following a generational talent in Trevor Lawrence. What he actually did at Clemson was way, way better 
than the perception that's out there in terms of the media. Now, I tried not to read a whole lot of like the articles and things like that, but I did want to get a perspective on what the nation sort of thought of him. And it does feel like his time at Clemson is viewed as a failure. And it was not that it is. Uh, it's almost like he just completely underperformed. He didn't underperform. He did not have the pieces around him to succeed at the level that a Trevor Lawrence did. Um, you know, if you look at his time to pass at Clemson, it was 2.71 seconds on non-play action plays. Um at Oregon State, it's been it was 3.1 or 3.15 uh, time to pass on on non play action plays. So he's he's had almost half a second longer at uh, you know at his newest place than he had at, at Clemson. The pressure rates are way higher at um, Clemson than they were at Oregon State. The pressure rate or the his scramble rate at Clemson. He had 18 scrambles the year uh, of 2022. In 2023, he only had 10 scrambles, so he almost decreased them by half, and a lot of that is by design in terms of the offense and then the protection that he had up front. So I, I really think that that kind of tells the story of his time there at Clemson. Yep. Um, the guy made 22 big-time throws in 2022. The perception is all of a sudden this year he's, he's fixed. He's so much better. He's so much – he had 20 big time throws this year mm -hmm. at at Oregon State. So it's the same number. He's the same guy. Um, was he a little bit more efficient? You know, um, yes, but he had better pieces around him. Um, you know, it just it just was a better fit for for what he was doing. But it more so had to do with his time, and you know, uh, a lot of the even the Oregon State clips we'll see. You could see there's some hangover from from this time at Clemson where he doesn't think he has as much time as he has. And you can see it in his footwork. Also, if Dabo Swinney has a vote in this conversation, he fired his offensive coordinator and brought in Garrett Riley as DJU was was leaving the institution. So clearly, from the coach's perspective, it wasn't just a, a quarterback problem. It was an offense problem and a coordinator problem. So that counts for something, too. But the next stop on the journey is out in Oregon. Oregon State. He was a, a, a beaver for one season under Jonathan Smith before heading now to Tallahassee to play for Mike Norvell in Florida State. What does Dominic Robinson see from the film from DJ Uyunglele from Oregon State? Find out next time here on War Chan TV. Be sure to hit the like button underneath the video. Subscribe to the channel. Uh, as always, we thank director Ben Spicer behind the scenes for cutting up this video. Dominic, awesome talking to you. Look forward to our next in the three-part series.